And uh, we, we're going to be posting the slides on our website. So Bob being victimized by the fact that we have this, we, we have this balance we have to strike between having a good number of speakers, and then of course we have to cut down the time apiece. But uh, uh, I saw that, whoa, at one minute. But we'll have those uh, slides posted online so you can see the science there uh, for yourselves. Oftentimes, uh, let me make sure before I start going here, this is, this is the Hello. clicker, here we go. Oftentimes folks say to me, James, uh, you, you present all the science, I find it on your website, I find it from the scientists, but it's very difficult for me to convey that to friends and neighbors. And sometimes it's very difficult for me to understand. Can you give me, I don't want you to cut out the science, but can you simplify it in a way that we can deliver it in 10 minutes, that it's straightforward, that uh, it's visually friendly? And that's what I'm going to try to do today, discussing our climate sensitivity to carbon dioxide. We're going to address five questions here. The first one is, what is the context of recent warming? That's very important. The fact that the Earth may be warming or cooling in and of itself doesn't tell us much if we don't know the context. Secondly, what is the pace of recent warming? Again, important for the same reason. Even if we're experiencing warming, the pace is very important. Third, what is the cause of recent warming? Fourth, how do the computer models function because they're predicting so much catastrophic warming in the future, so much acceleration of warming? And finally, how have computer model predictions fared? First of all, this is, this is a fantastic visual. This is a history of the Earth's temperature going back, depending on which chart you want to look at on the top left, going back 100,000 years uh, through the depths of the last ice age, last ice age epoch. On the top right, we have the past 10,000 years. And on the bottom, we have the past 2,000 years. The one I want you to focus on right now is the top right, where we see the past 10,000 years. Once we emerged from the last Ice Age epoch, over the past 8,000 years, temperatures have been substantially warmer than today for the vast majority of that time period. On the far right, you see temperatures today, and then moving backwards over time as you go to the left. Alarmists often talk about these being the hottest decade or years in history, because they wanted to find history as only the past hundred or so years, which coincides with the depths of the Little Ice Age. They want you to forget that while human civilization developed and flourished, temperatures were substantially warmer than today. Temperatures would have to continue warming at the pace. You can see on the far right, the pace of our warming is not very rapid. We'd have to continue warming at that pace for a few centuries before we reach the temperatures that dominated over the past several thousand years. These data, by the way, are provided by the European Science Foundation, the Greenland Ice Core Project. It's objective data. I didn't make it up. Secondly, IPCC, for as much heat as we give them, and justifiably, they do occasionally get some things right. And this is one they got right in their very first report. Here we see temperature histories very similar to what I just showed. And the two most important would be in the middle and the bottom, where again we see current temperatures on the far right. We see over the past 10,000 years, and then uh, we see also in the past 1,000 years how temperatures today still are not at historically high levels. We, we can still warm a significant amount before we reach temperatures that have prevailed in the past and in which human civilization developed and thrived. And indeed, here we look at the past several ice age epochs and interglacial warm periods. We're in an interglacial warm period now. Now we're going to look at the far left for the present uh, temperatures. I should have flipped this around for you for consistency. But notice how today our, inter our present interglacial warm period is not as warm as any of the past four. So we're not in any un unprecedented temperature range right now within our interglacial warm period. And even within that, our present interglacial is relatively cool compared to previous ones. This is real interesting. Here we see solar output data. And we can go back in time. And this was published in, published in Geophysical Research Letters. It's a peer-reviewed publication. We go back to the 1600s, we see the depths of the Little Ice Age moving up to today. Can I go back? Yes, indeed. So if you look at the bottom chart, this is the IPCC's own data, remember. I didn't make this up. Notice how on the bottom chart, look at about 15, 1600 AD. Look at that pattern. You see a very low level of, of temperatures. You see a step increase, a leveling out, and a step increase. Remember that pattern. There's solar output over the same period. It's an almost exact match. We see that solar variance has driven the climate over a period of hundreds of years. Now we can look, we can look more closely at the past hundred years or so. Uh, these next two slides were sent to me by Willie Soon, who we've all, we all know and have seen uh, during the conference. Here Willie in blue charted temperature over the United States and in red uh, solar activity going back over the past hundred or so years. Again, we see a very close correlation. 
Now, Willie, next, did the same thing regarding the Arctic. We're told the Arctic is a canary in the coal mine for global warming. On the left, we see the same. In red, we see solar output. And then in blue, we see temperatures. Again, fantastic correlation. And then on the far right, we see, instead of uh, uh, solar output in red, we see carbon dioxide. There is little to no correlation between carbon dioxide and temperature. So we see that the sun, even during the 20th century, folks will say, yeah, but things have changed since we've been putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Well, yeah, we're going to add some carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. We're going to have some warming. I'll talk about that in a second. But the sun still is the primary driver. We can see that in the objective data. So what about the computer models? Why do the computer models project so much warming, and why hasn't the warming occurred that they've predicted? predicted? A couple things to keep in mind. We know, as a matter of objective fact, scientists, no matter where you are on the issue, they agree. You can double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from pre-industrial era, and you would get 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming, all other things being equal. We also know that since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, we've seen an increase of about 40% in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we can do the math. It's very simple, 40% of 1.1 degrees Celsius. We can expect that carbon dioxide emissions from humans have probably caused about 0 0.4, a little more than 0 0.4 degrees Celsius since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. So how then do the computer models predict so much warming in the future? Well, they rely on what's known as positive feedbacks. They say a little bit of, well, they say the carbon dioxide we're adding will cause a little bit of warming. But that little bit of warming through various processes I'd be happy to address in Q&A, but I want to keep it simple, are going to cause more atmospheric humidity and a change in cloud cover where we're going to see more cirrus clouds, which allow sunlight to reach the surface but trap radiation going out into space. Those two factors, they say, are about three times more important than the carbon dioxide, but they're caused by the initial increase in carbon dioxide. So these positive feedbacks are where they get most of their warming. It's not the carbon dioxide itself. Now let's take a look at how those predictions have fared. First of all, what you're looking at here, this is a computer image. This was presented by a NASA satellite that was launched a little over a decade ago. And here we see uh, humidity throughout the Earth's surface. And the same satellite also measures cloud cover throughout the Earth's surface. Objective data, easily measurable, verifiable. Before I hit that, what the satellite data have found is that, first of all, regarding humidity, Atmospheric water vapor is not increasing as much as the models say. The models say you get more water vapor because of carbon dioxide. Water vapor is a very potent greenhouse gas. You get all this extra warming. They say that relative humidity will, at the very least, keep up with the pace of warming. So at the very least, we'll have constant relative humidity, or many of the models predict increasing relative humidity. But the NASA data show us that we have decreasing relative humidity. Instead of having a very strong positive feedback for the most important factor in these climate models, we have a negative feedback. Secondly, cloud cover. According to the models, they're programmed to assume that with a little bit of carbon dioxide warming, we're going to see an increase in cirrus clouds. As I mentioned, it's going to be a, a heat trapping factor. What these satellite data have shown instead is that we don't see an increase in cirrus clouds. When we get more cloud cover, it's coming in the form of low-level rain clouds. These block the sunlight from reaching the surface, and it cools the Earth. So again, the two factors that the models rely on for most of the projected warming and the positive feedbacks are actually not positive feedbacks. They're negative feedbacks. That's why the models have failed to anticipate the pause in warming we've had. That's why they failed to hindcast. And that's why when they predict so much warming in the future, it's not going to happen. It would have to, we'd have to flip a switch and see dramatic warming, a rapid increase that we have not seen in any of our generations, and it would have to occur for a full century to meet the model's projections. It's not happening. And those are the two reasons why. Now, I mentioned the satellite data here. Also, NOAA has been measuring relative humidity through weather balloons going back to the 1940s. We see the same thing where we have relative humidity declining over this long period. When I've brought this up in debates and discussions, uh, the alarmists will often say, well, that's not a long enough time period. You don't have enough data. I mean, are you kidding me? The laws of physics are the laws of physics. And the data that stretched back to the 1940s are the data that stretched back to the 1940s. You do not see an increase in relative humidity. You do not see an increase in cirrus clouds. That's why the models fail. So in conclusion, here are the points that we've discovered and that are so important in this debate. Global warming is occurring. As I mentioned, you add carbon dioxide to get a little bit of warming. But it's occurring at a very modest pace. 
The context is extremely important. Temperatures are relatively cool compared to the past 8, 10,000 years. How can we be in a human-caused global warming crisis when we're cooler than the temperatures that predominated during most of human civilization? Humans are likely causing some global warming, but it appears that the sun and other natural factors, I address the sun because I believe that's the strongest one. I believe that's what the scientific evidence shows, but we can talk about clouds, uh, ocean circulation, etc. But regardless, we see from the objective data that nature, and most likely the sun, are the primary drivers, even if we're seeing some increase in human-caused global warming. Fourth, flawed assumptions about water vapor and cloud impacts explain why the models failed, and they continue to fail. And then finally, pulling it all together, sure, humans are causing some global warming. I don't think anybody here believes we're still in the Little Ice Age. That's not the issue that's in debate, although the alarmists would like to make people think that. What we know is that the Earth's climate sensitivity appears to be quite modest. We're getting a little bit of warming, but nowhere near the alarming crisis that people say. So that, folks, is my simplified bring it to your neighbors presentation. Thank you very much.